were less likely to hold management positions and earn less than those without a disability, especially among men. Among Canadians with a disability, 12 per cent reported having been refused a job in the previous five years as a result of their condition. The percentage was 33 per cent among 25 to 34-year-olds with a severe or very severe disability. I'm sure members on all sides of the House would agree that the measures we are proposing today in Bill C-81 will help address this inequality and that they are long overdue. This is how Bill C-81 will work, Madam Speaker. Compliance tools. The Accessibility Commissioner would have access to a variety of proactive enforcement tools to verify compliance and to prevent non-compliance within the Act. Proactive inspections of regulated entities would be a large part of ensuring that the onus of barrier removal is not placed on individual Canadians. The Accessibility Commissioner would be empowered to conduct an inspection of any place that he or she considers necessary to verify the compliance. In addition, the Commissioner would have the authority to conduct paper-based inspections through production orders. If following an inspection, the Accessibility Commissioner found that an organization had contravened its obligation under the Act, there are a variety of different tools the Commissioner could use to ensure compliance. One of these tools is compliance orders. A compliance order would ensure that if the inspector sees a barrier that needs to be removed immediately, the inspector can order this to be done within a time frame that the Commissioner considers appropriate. For instance, if an organization has placed garbage cans blocking an accessible entrance, an inspector could order that those garbage cans be removed without delay. The Accessibility Commissioner would also have the authority to issue notices of violation. These notices could be given with a warning or with a monetary penalty. Under Bill C-81, the maximum penalty for a violation would be $250,000. The penalty issued for a given violation would depend on the nature and the severity of the issue, the criteria for which would be set out in regulations. However, Bill C-81 also includes the idea of continuing violations, whereby a violation that continues more than one day would constitute a separate violation for each day and could result in separate $250,000 penalties each day that the, penalty, that the violation continues. Additionally, if the possibility of an administrative monetary penalty is not enough to encourage an organization to comply with their obligations, Bill C-81 would also provide authority to publish the name of the organization or person who committed the violation, along with the amount of the penalty. In terms of jurisdiction, compliance and enforcement under Bill C-81 would build on existing expertise within the Government of Canada and fill gaps where needed. Bill C-81 expands on existing sector-based mandates authorities, expertise and experience in relation to accessibility within the federal transportation network and broadcasting and telecommunications services. Both the Canadian Transportation Agency and the Canadian Radio and Television and Telecommunications Commission have existing accessibility mandates. Bill C-81 proposes to enhance these mandates and to expand the powers and responsibilities of the Canadian Transportation Agency as well as the CRTC Commission in relation to accessibility. The Canadian Transportation Agency would continue to be responsible for accessibility for passengers in the federal transportation network with an enhanced mandate, responsibilities and powers. The Canadian Radio and Television and Telecommunications Commission will continue to be responsible for accessibility in relation to broadcasting and telecommunications services with new responsibilities for overseeing accessibility plans, feedback processes and progress reports. Through amendments to the Canada Transportation Act, the Canadian Transportation Agency would have new proactive compliance tools to ensure that those in the federal transportation network are meeting their accessibility obligations. These compliance tools are very similar to those of the Accessibility Commissioner, including the ability to issue notices for violations with fines, again, up to $250,000. Given the whole of government approach to ensuring the removal of barriers in federal jurisdiction, the bill requires that the various authorities put in place mechanisms for collaboration and coordination across organizations regarding their policies and practice in relation to accessibility. In terms of remedies, although the focus of Bill C-81 is on proactive and systemic change, the bill also provides for complaints mechanisms for individuals who have been harmed by an organization's non-compliance with their accessibility obligations. Bill C-81 provides a right to individuals to file complaints with the Accessibility Commissioner if they have been harmed or have suffered property damage or economic loss as a result of 
or have otherwise been adversely affected by the contravention of an entity <coughs> of regulations made under the proposed Accessibility Act. If, after investigating a complaint, the Accessibility Commissioner finds that the complaint is substantiated, the Commissioner could order a broad range of remedies, including that the entity that committed the contravention take appropriate corrective measures, make opportunities sorry, make available to the complaint the rights, opportunities, or privileges that they have been denied, pay compensation to the complainant for wages that they were deprived of and for the expense incurred by them as a result of the contravention, pay compensation to the complainant for the additional costs of obtaining alternative goods, services, facilities, or accommodation as a result of the contravention, pay compensation for any pain and suffering that the complainant experienced, and pay the complainant an amount if the Accessibility Commissioner determines that the contravention is as a result of willful or reckless practice. The maximum amount that could be awarded for each of pain and suffering and willful and reckless practice would be initially set at $20,000, but Bill C-81 includes a provision that would increase these amounts over time to account for inflation. If individuals and organizations think that the Accessibility Commissioner made an error in dismissing a complaint or in ordering a remedy, they would have the ability to make an appeal. For most complaints, these appeals would go to the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal. For complaints about the parliamentary entities, appeals would go to the Federal Public Sector Labor Relations and Employment Board. The Accessibility Commissioner wouldn't be responsible for dealing with all complaints, however. In recognition of and to leverage the existing expertise of the Canadian Transportation Agency and the CRTC Commission, these organizations would be responsible for dealing with complaints in the Federal Passenger Transportation Network and in respect of the Broadcasting and Telecommunications Acts, respectively. Although the amendments to the Canadian Transportation Act proposed in Bill C-81, the Canadian Transportation Agency would continue to deal with complaints in relation to on-due barriers to the mobility of persons with disabilities in the Federal Transportation Network with enhanced remedies, such as compensation for pain and suffering, that are better aligned with the remedies available under the Canadian Human Rights Act. The Canadian Transportation Agency would also deal with a new type of complaint that addresses contraventions of regulations made <coughs> under the Canadian Transportation Act that result in harm similar to the complaints to the Accessibility Commissioner proposed under the Accessible Canada Act with similar remedies for individuals. Mr. Speaker, and for complaints about broadcasting and telecommunication services, Canadians would continue to file complaints with the CRTC Commission, which would, be, which would use its existing authorities under the Broadcasting Act and Telecommunications Act to address complaints. In the case of grievances, many public service and parliamentary employees have existing grievance rights, and Bill C-81 builds on these rights through amendments to the Federal Public Sector Labor Relations Act and the Public Service Employment Act and the Parliamentary Employment and Staff Relations Act. These employees will be referred to the complaints for adjudication. And I guess I'll have, perhaps I'll have an opportunity to continue after the break. No? Well, let me just conclude by saying, Mr. Speaker, that I hope all members of the House support this bill at this reading so that it can go to um, go to committee where it can be reviewed and sent back to the House for approval. Thank you. Statements by members. Déclaration de député. L'honorable député de la The Honourable Member for La Pointe de Lille. Mr. Speaker, this weekend we were all shaken by the images of devastation following the tornado's passage in Gatineau and on behalf of the Bloc Québécois, I wish to express my full solidarity with the victims. Our hearts are with you as you struggle through this disaster, which will call on huge amounts of resilience. I would like to thank responders and volunteers who have given priceless support. Yesterday, the government of Quebec announced immediate financial aid to the Red Cross while it awaits a full accounting of the damage. I expect the Canadian government to do the same. We also call on the generosity of citizens for people living in the area, uh, donations of uh, non-perishable goods and hygienic products are um, being received at the former C's location at the Galerie of Hull. And for all Quebecers, you can always make uh, financial donations to the Red Cross. Congratu um, much courage to everyone and to the citizens of Gatineau. For Spadina, Fort York.
Mr. Speaker, local democracy is under attack in Toronto. While the rest of Ontario's municipalities are holding elections without any interference, Toronto's vote has been plunged into chaos by the Ford government at Queen's Park. The decision to disrupt the election while already in progress was and is wrong. The arbitrary, unexpected and poorly executed move to cut the size of Toronto City's Council is creating uncertainty and confusion. Voters don't know which ward they're in, they don't know which community council is going to handle the critical issues of their neighbourhood. Mr. Speaker, local democracy matters. No other city in Ontario is being treated this way. It's not right and it's not fair. The Premier has bragged that some parts of Toronto will be overrepresented, while others will be deliberately discriminated against. This is vindictive and it's undemocratic. Our government knows that municipalities are critical partners in making life better for Canadians. Mr. Speaker, cities matter, Toronto matters, and the people of Toronto have the right to govern themselves through free and fair elections. Thank you. Honourable Member for Banff Airdrie. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize the long-standing legacy of Spray Lake Sawmills in Cochrane, Alberta, as they celebrate their 75th anniversary. This family-owned business was founded in 1943 by Chester Melsness, who set up a permanent home for the sawmill in the town of Cochrane in 1969. The sawmill created jobs for the residents of Cochrane, but to the Melsness family, it was also an opportunity to have a positive impact on the growth of a community. Through countless philanthropic gestures, including the construction of a world-class recreation centre, giving back has always been essential to their model of business. Though at the ripe old age of 99, Chester now leaves the management of the sawmill up to his son Barry, the importance of the community is still apparent in everything that they do to give back. There are probably not many projects in Cochrane that have not been touched by the Melsness family. And to Spray Lake Sawmills and the Melsness family, I would like to thank you for all that you've done to contribute to the growth and the prosperity of Cochrane and area. And congratulations on achieving this milestone, and here's to another 75 years. Honourable Member for Oakville North Burlington. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thanks to the leadership of the MP for Mississauga Lakeshore, this week is Canada's first Gender Equality Week. This week, Canadians are invited to reflect on and address the challenges faced by women and gender diverse individuals. Advancing gender equality is not only right, it's also smart. If we move forward with meaningful changes, we could add $150 billion to our GDP in less than a decade. In my riding, I run a program called Young Women in Leadership, where we pair young women with businesses and organizations for a job shadow. It gives young women a chance to experience a career they may not have otherwise considered and has inspired some to change their mind about what path to pursue. Gender equality means a larger workforce with more diverse ideas and better decision making. Let's allow Canada's first Gender Equality Week to inspire us because it's, if we get this right, we all benefit. The Honourable Member for Jean Pierre. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to talk today about a baseball team in my riding, the Voyageurs de Saguenay. After another good season, I'd just like to mention the highlights of the team. Coach Martin Pouliot came on board with the junior team in October 2015, and thanks to his hard work and that of the players, the Voyageurs won their first division title since uh, they joined Quebec's Junior Elite Baseball League in 1995. Despite their ultimate defeat on December 15, I want to recognize all the hard work done by the Voyageurs coach, who thrilled and excited the sports scene in our area after his team was eliminated in the last game. The coach said, the best place to play junior elite baseball is in Saguenay. To that I say, thank you. Thank you for having taken the team so far. You've turned our region into a great place to play sports. Congratulations to the Voyageurs and thanks for the memories. Honourable Member for Don Valley North. Uh, Mr. Speaker, today many families from across Canada will reunite to celebrate the Mid-Autumn Festival, a special day of togetherness with the loved ones and the friends. It is an opportunity to champion the benefit of a vibrant multicultural Canada where diversity is our strength. It is also a chance to celebrate the many contributions made by Asian Canadians whose culture, traditions and heritage enrich the lives of all Canadians. 
It is in this spirit of celebration and togetherness that I welcome parliamentarians from all the parties uh, to celebrate the Mid-Autumn Festival in Sir John MacDonald building right after tonight's vote. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thanks. The Honourable Member for Richmond Centre. Mr. Speaker, on behalf of my constituents in Richmond, I'm excited to join Canadians of Chinese, Korean, Japanese and Vietnamese descent in celebration of the Mid-Autumn Festival, when families and friends will come together in harmony under the full moon for good food and fellowship. Originally, a Chinese harvest tradition focused around moon worship. The Moon Festival now celebrates giving thanks, unity and prayer. Mr. Speaker, while I encourage all Canadians to join their neighbours in celebrating this special festival, I also offer my thoughts and prayers to those who have been affected by the two tornadoes that struck the National Capital Region this past weekend. The moon will shine again tonight. Happy Moon Festival. Honourable Member for Kingston and the Islands. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I thank you for the opportunity to rise in the House today to recognize language diversity. It's time to reevaluate how we define and practice communication in our communities. Yesterday was our country's very first International Day of Sign Languages, and I am honoured to welcome to the Hill today my constituent, Jessica Sargent, who is a great advocate for the deaf community. Sign languages are equal to spoken languages and thus should be widely embraced and accessible. For deaf people, early access to sign language is vital to their growth and development. We must not treat deaf people as disabled and we need to embrace our differences and encourage the growth and acceptance of sign languages as a norm. Therefore, Mr. Speaker, I encourage you and all my colleagues from all sides of the House to not only celebrate this first International Day of Sign Languages, but to also reflect on how we can better represent all languages throughout our diverse country. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Honourable Member for Steveston, Richmond East. Mr. Speaker, on Saturday, I joined the Richmond Chinese Community Society at Lansdowne Centre in celebrating Mid-Autumn Festival. I would like to thank Linda Lee, Thomas Yu, Phyllis Chan, Michael Chu, and all the great volunteers at RCCS for organizing this great annual event. On cette occasion de réjouissance. At this happy time, family and friends gathered to mark the harvest and the successes of the previous year. I'm honored, Mr. Speaker, to rise in the House today to extend my best wishes to all those in Steveston, Richmond East, and across Canada as they celebrate the Mid-Autumn Festival. Mr. Speaker, let me wish everyone a safe and happy time and a year of prosperity and good fortune. The Honourable Member. Mr. Speaker, this endless Liberal summer of failure seems to go on and on. As an amateur hunter and member of the Conservative uh, Caucus on Hunting and Fishing, I rise today. This is a very important time of year for hunters. I recently participated in the activities of a shooting club in my riding, and I was giving a thorough demonstration of the application of security measures and laws for all those who practice the sport. And I did the same thing at Ilougru in my riding as well. In a region like ours, Hunting is not only a pastime, but it's a lifestyle. It's hard to deny it, since Montmagny is uh, the uh, white goose capital of Canada. The impact of hunting is tangible for us on a daily basis. But my constituents are worried about C-71 because it will not bring down gun violence and will only increase red tape. I'm committed to defending the interests of hunters in my region by saying no to the costly, useless and inefficient registry The Honourable Member for Hull Elmer. Last Friday, the National Capital Region, including Hull Elmer, was hit by a tornado. Thanks to the rapid national alarm system, we were able to find shelter. But hundreds of people now cannot sleep at home anymore, and I went to the affected areas minutes after 
the tornado hit and the damage was incredible. But what I'd like to share with you is a story is of resilience. I saw just how much solidarity there is in Gatineau. It's not the curveballs life throws at us which matters, it's how we deal with them. Mayor Maxime Pedneau-Jodouin, the Red Cross, Idol Quebec, Civil Security Forces, Gatineau City employees, first responders, STO drivers, business people, and many volunteers all pulled together and pitched in. I invite all Canadians to donate to the Red Cross to help those who've lost everything. To the victims, know that the community and all levels of government stand with you. To the residents of Hall Aylmer, I say to you, thank you. You are making all the difference in the world. Honourable member for Long Range Mountains. Monsieur le Président, I'm pleased today to oh. recognize one of Canada's oldest and most historically significant industries, the fur trade. From Jacques Cartier to Simon de Champagne, the First Nations and the Hudson's Bay Company, the fur trade was and continues to be crucial to our resource-based economy. There are over 60,000 Canadians that work in various sectors of the fur trade, including mink and fox farms, trappers, designers, auction houses, manufacturers, retailers, artisans, and many more. The fur trade provides income for people in rural and remote regions, including many Indigenous communities, and I'm proud to have a mink breeder in my riding of the Long Range Mountains. Fur is a sustainably produced renewable natural resource with strict animal welfare standards, and it's these standards that pr produce our world-renowned furs worn and sought after by many. Canadians can be proud of this heritage industry. It showcases our excellence on the world stage. In closing, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to encourage all members to attend the Canadian Mink Breeders Association reception this evening in Centre Block. The Honourable Member for Carleton. On, on Friday, storms ripped through communities, uprooted homes, and tore apart the lives of people right across the great, greater capital region. Yet, our first responders, our volunteers, our charities, and our friends and neighbours all rallied together to take care of one, of one another in this extraordinary time of need. Even though the lights were out at many intersections, spontaneous order broke out as people used courtesy and common sense in order to make it through all of the confusion. To all those people who are most affected, who've lost their homes, know that we stand with you, that we admire your courage, and we present you with our total solidarity as you re rebuild your lives. The Honourable Member for Toronto Danforth. Knock, knock, Mr. Speaker. Who's there, you ask? Well, me and a big bunch of comedians. And you know what else? They're a lot funnier than me. But they are here today on a more serious note because they are here in this place to be advocating on behalf of stand-up comedians across our country. As a country, we take pride in our comedians, but many of us probably don't realize that comedy is not a recognized artistic activity or a discipline by the Canada Council for the Arts. And in fact, it isn't recognized as an art form by any province or territory across our country. That's not something to laugh about. Thank you to Sandra Battellini and all of the comedians who form part of the Canadian Association of Stand-Up Comedians for your advocacy and your hard work on this issue. Sometimes you make us laugh, sometimes so hard we cry. We stand with you and we take so much pride in your art form. Thank you. I can just sense members getting nervous about any cracks they were planning to make during question period. The Honourable Member for Hamilton Mountain. Mr. Speaker, I was honoured to host our leader Jagmeet Singh in our riding of Hamilton Mountain this past Friday. We had the opportunity to meet with Hamilton residents to talk about the NDP goal of universal thermocare. I would like to thank the Hamilton Poverty Roundtable members, Linda Gill of the Federation of University of Women, and many others who participated. We heard about Jody's grandmother, who received life-saving treatment, but then couldn't afford the $700 per month drug cost to keep her alive. 
and the person who relies on the generosity of the drug companies to cover high drug costs they can't afford. What happens when that generosity runs out? We heard about residents ending up in emergency with an asthma attack, taking up precious emergency room resources because they could not afford their asthma medication. After hearing the tragic stories of seniors and working families making a choice between, between paying rent and paying for food, life-saving life medication, I am more convinced than ever that this time to implement a universal pharmacare program. We can't afford not to. The Honourable Member for Moose Jaw Lake Centre Lanark. Mr. Speaker, I first met the member from York Simcoe back in 1995 when Regina hosted the Grey Cup. And it was readily apparent to me at that time that this member had two great loves. CFL football and politics, as evidenced by the fact he hasn't missed a Grey Cup game in over 30 years, and he's been an elected member of Parliament for over 14 years. Well, several years later, we met again as we were both elected in the 2004 federal election. And after a couple of years in opposition, we formed government in 2006, and I had the pleasure of being named parliamentary secretary to this member as he served two times in the role of government house leader. Well, sadly, Mr. Speaker, today marks the last time this member will sit in this chamber as he has decided to retire. And over those 14 years, Mr. Speaker, this member has been a great friend and a mentor to me. And so on behalf of all of my parliamentary colleagues, I simply say thank you, PVL, for your great service to our country, to our institution, and Parliament will be diminished by your absence. <laughs> Occasions, on occasions like this, we sometimes allow a little skirting of the rules about naming members, of course. The Honourable Member for Canada, Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On Friday, our amazing community of Dunrobin and my riding of Canada, Carleton, was devastated as an EF3 tornado touched down, destroying homes and businesses, causing injury and unimaginable destruction. Over the weekend, I witnessed an amazing emergency response. Mayor Watson, City Councillor El Shantiri, they led an all-out effort to come to the aid of Dunrobin. Police, firefighters, paramedics, support workers, the team at West Carlton Secondary School, road, building, hydro and gas crews, giving it their all. They sent in de gens en travail. Hundreds of people worked incredibly hard to help those in need. To help donate to the Red Cross. To those who have been on duty for the last three days straight, I say thank you very much for your efforts. And to the residents of Dunrobin, you are an example of amazing community strength and compassion. You are in our thoughts as you hit, as you face this tragedy face on, and we will be there with you. You're here. Thank you. Questions oral, oral questions. L'honorable député de The Honourable Member for Richmond, Arthabasca. Mr. Speaker, the people of Gatineau in Ottawa have been affected by a Force 3 tornado. Level damage. Come to my colleagues in like all my colleagues in this house, my thoughts are with the people affected by this tragic event. And I would like to say that all Canadians stand in solidarity with these people. Can the government bring us up to date on the situation and tell us how it intends to help those affected? Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, first of all, on behalf of the government, let me associate myself with the remarks of the Honourable Gentleman. Everyone in this House uh, is thinking of the people who have suffered such loss over the course of this last weekend. Uh, the Government of Canada was in constant communication with the provincial and municipal authorities during the course of the weekend to make sure that if any access to federal uh, assistance were to be required, that that would be made available immediately. Uh, and we have cooperated completely with the local officials, including today in providing geomatic mapping service to both the provinces of Ontario and Quebec to ensure that they have the very best possible information in coping with the circumstance. 
Massachusetts. Bab, député de Richmond. The Honourable Member for Richmond after Pascal. Mr. Speaker, the Minister responsible for border security and organized crime has said that a majority of immigrants who arrived uh, illegally last year have left our territory. This assertion is totally false. According to Canada Border Services Agency, only 398 of 32,173 immigrants who came in illegally have been expelled. Mr. Speaker, how can we trust this minister when he doesn't know the true facts of his own file? Honorable Minister of Border Security. Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the opportunity to, to speak to this issue. During a media interview this past weekend, I created unnecessary confusion by mistakenly <laughs> suggesting that the majority of assignment claimants have left. My intention was to explain how people de deemed ineligible after exhausting all due process are in fact removed. Immediately upon becoming aware of the confusion that I had created, I took immediate steps to clarify my remarks mm -hmm. And to apologize. Mr. Speaker, as part of our government's ongoing commitment to openness and transparency, we post information related to irregular migration online, and all statistics related to assignment claims, interceptions, processes are publicly available. Honorable Deputy de Richemont. The Honorable Member for Richemont after Basca. These are the facts, Mr. Speaker. Since the Minister was appointed, no concrete plan has been presented to Canadians or to MPs. No plan to resolve the border crisis, which has lasted almost two years. It seems that the minister doesn't even have the right data when he answers journalists or when opposition MPs ask him questions. Now, we're asking the minister to show leadership and present a plan, because if he doesn't have one, we do. Mr. Speaker, the government remains unshakable in its commitment to protect Canadian security and to keep our borders safe. The minister apologized for any possible confusion he created. That's the Conservatives. They like to create fear. And we have seen over the past year an increase in 50 percent in uh, demands or to stay here. He knows Hill. Mr. Speaker, when the minister was asked by Global News if he was tracking the whereabouts of 33,000 illegal border crossers, he claimed, quote, that the overwhelming majority of illegal border crossers had left the country. Yet today, the Globe and Mail reports that only six illegal border crossers have actually been removed by Canada and by his government. So a very precise question. If the government has moved six illegal border crossers, how many illegal border crossers remain in Canada? Yeah. Honourable Minister of Border Security. Yeah, I, Mr. Speaker, I, I know that the member opposite, because of her vast experience on the immigration file, knows that individuals who come to our country, cross into, into Canada, and seek the protection of Canada and, and asylum for, as they flee from persecution are not illegal pro crossers and are dealt with according to law. They are entitled by international convention and Canadian law to due process and humanitarian support. The Honourable Member for Calgary knows Hill. Well, perhaps I created some confusion, Mr. Speaker. I asked him very clearly how many illegal border crossers remained in Canada and he couldn't answer. I'm going to ask what every Canadians want to know after that disastrous interview. If the Minister can't tell the House how many illegal border crossers remain in Canada, how can they possibly expect to believe that he knows where they are? Where are they? Honourable Minister of Border Security. Mr. Speaker, under Canadian law, all people are coming into this country seeking asylum are, are entitled to due process. When all of those processes have been exhausted and they are deemed ineligible, they are subject to removal by CBSA. The, the, the people that, that the, the member opposite is referring to are still engaged in that process, and when those processes are complete, the law will take effect. The Honourable Member for Rimouski, Niger, Timiskwata, Les Basques. Mr. Speaker, to have a discussion, there have to be two sides. Testimony of members 
of Indigenous communities with respect to the TMX shows that the discussion really wasn't a discussion. It was a monologue before bureaucrats. Discussing means sitting down and sharing. Does the government understand that it has a constitutional obligation to hold consultations, meaningful consultations, with Indigenous peoples? The speaker, our government understands that there's no relationship more important to our government than the relationship with ind Indigenous people. I have started reaching out to Indigenous uh, leaders before the decision of the federal court, and I have continued to do so. We believe that we will engage with them in a meaningful two-way dialogue and listen to their concerns very, very carefully in order to move forward on this project in the right way. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member. Well, there's quite a leap from words to action. This uh, weekend, the Minister of Fisheries recognized that the government had not adequately consulted Indigenous communities. The problem is that without the intervention of the federal court, the government would never have respected the will nor the voices of Indigenous communities. The government says it's holding consultations, but in fact, it's already made its decision to force the expansion of Trans Mountain. I'd like a clear answer. Will the government force the expansion at any price? Mr. Speaker, Canadians expect us to uh work hard to make sure that we're expanding our resource market mm -hmm. beyond the U.S. market. And they also expect us to follow the highest standard possible, engaging on the indigenous consultation as well as respecting and protecting the environment. That's exactly what we have been doing, and that's the course we, that is the course we will follow as we move forward, making sure that we're moving forward on Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion in the right way. Honourable Member for North Island, Powell River. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to Trans Mountain, the Minister of National Resources said the Liberals, quote, should have engaged in meaningful dialogue with Indigenous peoples. And he's right. He should have, and they didn't. The Indigenous communities confirmed that there was not a meaningful two-way discussion, and the courts agree. Now this weekend we hear there is no guarantee all concerns raised by Indigenous people will be addressed. Okay. How is that meaningful consultation? Why are the Liberals satisfied with the bare minimum when it comes to their most important relationship? Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, uh, I would encourage the Honourable Member to uh, look at the court ruling. court has acknowledged that we put a framework in place that was sound, that we engaged in good faith in engaging with the Indigenous uh, peoples, and we will continue to do so. We have uh, uh, instructed the NEB to take steps uh, to uh, initiate the uh, inclusion of uh, marine shipping and the impact of that on the environment in the in the review that they will undertake over the next 22 weeks, and we will be announcing our next steps shortly. Member for North Island, Powell River. Mr. Speaker, I encourage the member to read the decision, where it's very clear that they say in the decision that it was only note takers, not decision makers. And when it comes to actual having consultation, it is imperative that finally we see a two-way discussion, which a meaningful consultation happens. In fact, when you say that the pipeline will be built on one hand, and on the other hand you say you're going to have meaningful consultation, it's not only misleading; <laughs> it's absolutely insulting. The courtrooms confirmed the Liberals' consultation process was completely false. Indigenous people need to meet with decision makers, not note takers. So it's common sense. How can the Liberals think that we do the, uh, the use of you in that, uh, in that question perhaps could be interpreted to mean one or it could mean you as in terms of people across the way. So I'd ask members to be cautious, of course, and avoid and remember to direct their comments to the floor, the Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, as I stated earlier, there is no relationship more important to this government than the relationship with Indigenous peoples. And that's exactly what we have been uh, developing. We put a very strong framework in place, which court acknowledged that it was a sound framework. Yes, we fell short on the uh, on the implementation of uh, uh, that framework, and we have committed to do better. And we will do better. We will engage with Indigenous peoples in a meaningful two-way dialogue and listen to their concerns and offer accommodation where accommodation is possible. That's the only way to move forward. Honourable Member for Brantford-Brant. 
Mr. Speaker, when asked why veterans can't access benefits meant for them, the minister told veterans, and I quote, when you prepay at the pump, you put in 80 bucks. You don't fill it up, you get that credit back. But there's one guy out there who has no trouble accessing funds meant for veterans. Christopher Garnier, a murderer who never served a day in his life and went straight to the front of the line. When will the minister revoke veterans' benefits to this killer? Honourable Minister of Veterans Affairs. Mr. Speaker, uh, as I said before, I share the outrage of the honourable member and many members of this house. I cannot comment on the specifics of this case because it also involves a veteran here. This case involves a veteran whose privacy I must protect. I have asked officials to go back to find out what happened and to come back to me. Thank you. Order. I ask all members to listen to the answers, whether they like them or not, and wait for their turns, which will come eventually, I'm sure, to speak. The honourable member for Brantford Brant. Mr. Speaker, he killed Officer Catherine Campbell. He put her in a compost bin and he dumped her under a bridge. He has never worn the uniform, yet she wore two uniforms, one as a police officer and one as a volunteer firefighter. By his lawyer's own admission, Christopher Garnier developed his PS PTSD by strangling her to death. When will the minister take charge of his department and revoke veterans, veterans' benefits to this killer? The Minister of Veterans Affairs. Once again, Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the question, and I will return when my officials have come back and told me exactly how this is happening. Hello. 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 The Honourable Member for Chicoutimi Le Fior. Mr. Speaker, first I'd like to say that my heart goes out to the people of Gatineau and Ottawa who've been affected by the events of last Friday. Last week, the Veteran Affairs Minister said that he had asked for a review, a review of the file of Christopher Gallier. Can he finally tell us that he will end the benefits going to Mr. Gallier that come out of funds reserved for our brave veterans? Since Mr. Gallier is not a veteran, Mr. Speaker, he is a criminal. Mr. Speaker, our heart goes out to the family of Constable Campbell, but we cannot comment on the details of this case. But I have asked the department to try to better understand how this decision was taken. The Honourable Member for Chicoutimi Le Fior. Mr. Speaker, the minister says he's outraged by the situation. Canadians are outraged as well. The family of the victim is living with incomprehension and pain, but no action has been taken by the minister. The prime minister makes the decisions. He could put an end to this. What is he waiting for? The Honourable Veteran, Veterans Affairs Minister, Mr. Speaker, for reasons of confidentiality, we cannot comment on the details of this case. But we have asked for information in order to better understand how the decision was taken. In 2010, it was discovered that serial click killer Clifford Olson was receiving OAS payments. Now, Conservatives saw how outrageous that was, and we immediately took True. steps to, to stop it. <laughs> that same year, Carla Homolka almost got a pardon. Again, Conservatives saw how outrageous that was. We stopped it. Fast forward to today, we've learned that convicted murderer Chris Garnier who is not a veteran is getting veterans' benefits. What do the Liberals do? Sit on their hands and do absolutely nothing. Well, then when will that minister do the right thing, stop these payments? Honourable Minister of Veterans Affairs. 
again, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I cannot comment on, on the details of this case because, of course, a veteran is involved, and I shouldn't have to remind members opposite that their sharing of personal medical information of veterans for political gain is doubly the reason that we must protect veterans' personal information. Thank you. The Honorable. The Honourable Opposition House Leader. Mr. Speaker, that minister has the ability and the authority to stop yeah. payments from going to a convicted murderer who is not a veteran. We are not asking for information, we are asking for action. But why is it that Liberals always have the ability to defend the so-called rights of the Chris Garniers and the Omar Cotters and the returning ISIS terrorists of this world, but have excuse after excuse after excuse for doing nothing for veterans, for doing nothing to defend their ability to get support? When will the Liberals take action? Not information, action. Honourable Minister of Veterans Affairs. As I have stated in this House before, the centre of this case is a veteran, and I will not back down from protecting the rights of a veteran and a veteran's family and their right to privacy in this case. I have asked my officials to go back and find out how the decision was made and get back to me. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Port Moody Coquitlam. Sarah Alderman, a researcher at the University of Guelph, found that even short exposure to diluted bitumen can be deadly to young salmon, a critical species to BC's economy, tourism, and fishing industry. Canadians know when it comes to oil spills, the question is not if, but when. They also know the decision to buy the Trans Mountain Pipeline could be devastating since the Liberals have no plan in place to clean up a diluted, toxic, toxic bitumen oil spill on our coast. When will the government protect our wild salmon and abandon its disastrous plan to expand the Trans Mountain Pipeline? The Honourable Minister of Fisheries, Oceans and the Canadian Coast Guard. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This government has recognized the importance of ensuring environmental sustainability in the context of all of the decisions we've made. In the context of, of the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion, we've made significant investments in the spill prevention through the Oceans Protection Plan, spill response. We've done an enormous amount with respect to addressing all of the various concerns that are associated with the pipeline from an environmental perspective. At the end of the day, we understand that the environment and the economy must go together, and it is doing so in this case. The Honourable Member for Berthier. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to pipelines, Liberal, Tory, same old story. The people of Quebec no longer believe in the botched consultations or in the evaluation process, which has no credibility. The Liberals can try to defend themselves, but the Federal Court of Appeal was clear. Consultations with First Nations and affected communities, not their strong point. Now the Conservatives are trying to bring back Energy East and the response of Liberals is nebulous. Are the, can Quebecers expect a nasty surprise with Energy East? Mr. Speaker, Canadians expect that a government should work hard to get our resources to the global market. We have a condition where 99 percent of our oil is sold to one customer, which is the United States. So it's fundamental the responsibility that we expand the capacity to go to other markets. Canadians deserve well-paying middle-class jobs. That's what we're focused on. But we will move forward on this project in the right way, respecting the environment, at the same time engaging with ind Indigenous peoples in a meaningful two-way dialogue. The Honourable Member for Lakeland. Mr. Speaker, last Wednesday, the Prime Minister mocked the idea of legislation to get Trans Mountain built. He said it wouldn't create a, quote, predictable, clear path for investors around the world or in Canada. But newsflash, in April, he himself told Canadians the Liberals would bring in a law to, quote, reassert and reinforce federal jurisdiction to create certainty. Of course, he failed to deliver it. And the court said he failed on Trans Mountain. No wonder no one believes him. Where is the plan for the Trans Mountain expansion? Well, Minister of Natural Resources. Well, Mr. Speaker, let's talk about the Conservative record here for a minute and go give a flashback. When they took office in 2006, 99% of oil exports went to the United States. 
flash forward to 2015, Mr. Speaker, 99 percent of the oil exports still went to the United States. That is their record. We are working hard to ensure that we are expanding our non-U.S. market, but we will move forward on this project in the right way, respecting the environment, at the same time engaging with indigenous peoples in a meaningful two-way dialogue. Honorable Member for Lakeland. You know, I think this minister's constituents in particular and all Canadians would like to, him to show some urgency and actually take yeah. action because every single day of delay risks thousands of jobs and billions of dollars. The Liberals' failure is damaging Canada's reputation as a place to do business. 5,000 families now don't have jobs they were counting on. Opportunities for 43 Indigenous communities are at risk. And on Friday, the Liberals really just kicked the can down the road for another six months, and they still don't have a plan. These Liberals are 0 for 3 on getting pipelines built, and they just keep failing. So why should Canadians trust them now? Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, the Conservatives had 10 years to expand our global markets. They failed for 10 years. They did not do anything for 10 years. We will ensure that we are moving forward on expanding our global market, building pipeline capacity in a way that Canadians expect us to do so, which means that respecting the environment, at the same time consulting and engaging with Indigenous peoples in a meaningful two-way dialogue. We will not take a lesson from Harper Conservatives that failed Alberta workers for 10 years, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halliburton, Kawartha Lakes, Brock. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I might remind the Minister that when the Conservatives left office, they had three pipelines in the queue, and the Liberals now have zero. But yeah. speaking of that, the Liberals on Friday announced another six-month delay on Trans Mountain. Unfortunately, as the Prime Minister flounders, Ontario manufacturers are fleeing Canada. With no real plan in place, Friday was just one more failure in a summer of failures. Speaker, Ontario manufacturers know that every job created in the energy sector results in seven manufacturing jobs in Ontario. When will Ontarians so finally see a plan to save our manufacturing jobs? Honourable Minister of Economic Development. Mr. Speaker, we have a plan. That's what we ran on in 2015. That plan is focused on investing in Canadians. And because of that, we've seen unprecedented economic growth. Last year, the economy grew by 3%, the fastest growth rate amongst the G7 countries. Since we formed government in 2015, over 540,000 good quality jobs have been created. More Canadians are working, Mr. Speaker. That's a plan that we put forward. That plan is working and will continue to remain focused on Canadians. The Honourable Member for Kamloops, Thompson, Caribou. Mr. Speaker, First Nations communities were depending on Trans Mountain to provide jobs and economic opportunities. Forty-three First Nations had economic benefit agreements. They are now having to look at budget cuts to important programs and cutting back in terms of many of the things that they had hoped to do next year. And this is because of the Prime Minister's failure. Others are Indigenous businesses who now have contracts on hold. So how long is the Minister willing to deprive these 43 First Nations of the jobs and the economic opportunities? What is the plan? Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Mr. Speaker, we understand that we need to expand our global markets, and that's why we're working very, very hard. We have more confidence, the Harper Conservatives, in our energy sector. <laughs> because we believe that supporting our energy sector is the right thing to do. Supporting our workers, both indigenous communities and non-indigenous communities, is exactly what we're focused on. The economy is growing in Canada, as in Alberta, and 540,000 more Canadians are working today than they were working under Stephen Harper's government. Yeah, that's right. Honorable Deputy de Saint-Hyacinthe. The Honorable Member for Saint-Hyacinthe Bagot. Mr. Speaker, how can the Liberals claim to be progressive and feminist when they forced women to make a difficult choice to either pay exorbitant daycare costs or to stay home? Here in Ottawa, women are paying $65 a day for a daycare spot. At that price, it's not a service, it's an obstacle. Quebec understood the situation with its affordable child care system. Now, since it's 2018, what are the Liberals waiting for to put in place a universal child care system? Minister, good afternoon, sir. The Honourable Minister. 
Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I am grateful to my colleague opposite to, to for the question. We take these spaces seriously. It's important. It's uh, to support families, and it's also to ensure gender equality in 2018. Mr. Speaker, we put in place an ambitious uh, plan for some $5 billion over the next five years, the first plan in the history of Canada. We will have an opportunity to work with the provinces and municipalities that support us, and we count on that very broad support of governments and Canadians to take it even farther. For Saskatoon West. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker Saskatoon and Regina are among the most difficult places in Canada to find licensed childcare. In fact, the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternative Studies says that Saskatoon has only one licensed space for every four, ch for every four children, comparable to rural areas in Nunavut. In 2015, the Liberals promised a childcare framework that meets the needs of Canadian families wherever they live. Mm -hmm. Families throughout the country are still waiting. Will this so-called feminist government commit to a national childcare program to help families now? The Honourable Minister of Social Development. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm again very pleased to be able to be given this opportunity to tell this House and all Canadians how proud we are to be, since 2015, investing in a historically large investment plan to build more quality, affordable and accessible childcare services across Canada for all Canadians, including, Mr. Speaker, Indigenous Canadians and families. We announced just last week the first ever distinctions-based investment with our Indigenous people that will support hundreds of thousands of families across Canada and Indigenous communities to make sure that more of our... The Honourable Member for Marc Aurel Fortin. Mr. Speaker, Canada is a NATO founding nation and one of the Alliance's largest contributors. Canadians know that our commitment to the Alliance is strong. Under the Harper Conservatives, the previous government cut its support to the Canadian forces by $10 billion and withdrew from the world scene. Contrary to them, we are increasing annual defence expenditures to $32.7 billion. In other words, a more than 70 per cent increase. Honourable Minister of National Defence. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the Honourable Member uh, for his tireless work on the uh, defence base. Unlike the Conservatives, Mr. Speaker, unlike the Conservatives who withdrew from NATO and the world, our government is taking leadership roles within the Alliance. In July, we announced Canada will assume command of a NATO training mission in Iraq, and this will help build a more effective national security structure. The new training mission builds on the successes we have achieved in the region, where we continue to have an impact in the region, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Order. The Honourable Member for Durham. Mr. Speaker, the Junkin family owns a small business in Port Perry, Ontario, and sells boats for recreation. Both Brandon and his wife Martina work at the small business, as do both of Martina's parents. Like most businesses in this sector, they buy their inventory in the winter for sale in the summer. They have to pay the GST up front, and now they have to pay the Canadian tariffs up front. This means they'll buy fewer boats and they'll lose money this year. Why is the government failing to listen to these small businesses? Will they exempt these boats from the Canadian tariffs? Honourable Minister of Finance. I'm happy to address the question from the member opposite and say that, first of all, we've been trying to take into account Canadians across the country who have issues and real, real challenges in dealing with the tariffs that have been put in place as retaliatory measures against the United States. We are certainly listening to businesses to make sure that we get it right and that we deal with any problems in the implementation of those tariffs. That process is an ongoing, an ongoing process, one in which we are taking very seriously in order to make sure that businesses are not disadvantaged. The Honourable Member for Durham. Mr. Speaker, the Finance Minister re needs to recognize small businesses can't wait a year for relief from the tariffs their own government is imposing on them. They're collecting $300 million already in tariffs, but studies show most will go to large businesses. 
Small businesses like the Junkins can't afford armies of lobbyists and lawyers. They need to access tariff support now. Will the government streamline the application process and make support available to small businesses across Canada in the next month, not next year? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary for Canada-U.S. Relations. Order. Mr. Ooh. Speaker, our government understands that the U.S. 232 measures have created real challenges and hardship for Canadian workers and Canadian businesses. And that's why this government has made up to $2 billion available to defend and protect the interests of Canadian workers and businesses. These include measures such as extending work-sharing agreements, increased funding for skills training, funding to bolster competitiveness, and the teams are working through the night, Mr. Speaker, to get these resources out to those who are most affected. We're going to continue to monitor and supervise the situation and respond to protect our Canadian workers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Let's try somebody else. Alors, order. <laughs> I'll remember for Provence. Order. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Since July, we know that the government has imposed tariffs on the U.S. in uh, steel and aluminum, some 260 million, and this money is supposed to help Canadian companies. Now, uh, to date, they've given some $11,000 and a bit more. That's not very much, and that money is expected to go to large corporations and not to small and medium-sized businesses that need help. Why is the government once again uh, favoring large corporations over SMEs? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, we understand the hardship caused by these measures for Canadian workers. That is why, as we mentioned, we have made available some $2 billion. Our teams are working very hard to direct those funds to those who need them. The measures include, as I said, an extension of uh, work sharing programs, an increase in funding for training, and funds to improve competitiveness for manufacturers. And, Mr. Speaker, we are on the mark with these measures. The Honourable Member. Well, that's not exactly it at the target for the Liberal government is large players. The big companies, not the SMEs. The government is protecting the big players and setting aside the little ones. We saw that with the tax reform by the Minister of Finance. We saw it in the summer with the Liberal Carbon Tax. Large corporations have a uh, uh, lower tariff than others. So why is the Liberal government continuing to protect the big players and setting aside the small and medium-sized businesses in this country? The Honourable Minister. Small business is a backbone of our economy. We've always stood for and supported small businesses. That is why part of that $2 billion support package includes financing through Business Development Canada, BDC, specifically targeting small businesses with cash flow, with financing, with the support that they need. Mr. Speaker, we've stepped up for small business in the past and will continue to do so going forward as well. The Honourable Member for Courtney Alberni. Mr. Speaker, just this, just this Saturday, Liz Johnson and Demon Islanders pulled a record six tons of single-use and industrial plastics from Bain Sound in my riding. The Liberals say they are prioritizing ocean plastics, but their recent announcement lacks the urgency and funding coastal communities were counting on. Canadians expected more, and the environment can't wait. Will the Liberals support my motion, M151, and commit to binding targets that properly addresses single-use and industrial plastics in our oceans? Here, here. Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Environment. Uh, Mr. Speaker, plastic pollution is, is choking our oceans, our lakes and our rivers, damaging the places that Canadians love most. That's why the Prime Minister launched the Oceans Plastic Charter at the G7 in June, and why reducing global plastic pollution is a top priority for Canada's G7 presidency. We were pleased to see several new supporters of the Charter and to announce the government's commitment to diverting 75% of plastic waste from its operation in 2030 and committing $100 million to a marine litter mitigation fund. We all need to be part of the solution, Mr. Speaker, and look forward to continuing to work with our partners to keep plastics in our economy and out of our oceans. Member for Edmonton Strathcona. Mr. Speaker, today hearings begin on the largest bitumen mine in Canadian history. The Tech Resources Mine borders on Wood Buffalo National Park, a World Heritage Site UNESCO has declared at risk. Indigenous rights of Diné, Cree and Métis are impacted, who have long called for a buffer to protect threatened Donald Bison, 
the caribou and the watershed flowing into the Peace Athabasca Delta. These are measures the government has the power and duty to deliver on. Will this government today announce these measures? The Honourable Parliament, the Secretary to the Minister of Environment. Mr. Speaker, Canada is committed to addressing and responding to the World Heritage Committee in the requested time as is part of the ongoing commitment to protecting Canada's heritage places now and for future generations. Through Budget 2018, historic investments are going to protect Canada's nature, parks and wild spaces. Thanks to this commitment to Canada's natural legacy, over $27.5 million is going to be invested over five years in the development of and early implementation of the action plan for the Wood Buffalo National Park World Heritage Site. Mr. Speaker, this is an issue we take very seriously and I'm pleased that the member shares the same commitment that our side does. The Honourable Member for York Simcoe. Lake Simcoe Cleanup Fund made a difference, allowing community-based environmental groups to undertake projects to re remediate Lake Simcoe's health. It worked. The science has shown native species returning and breeding for the first time in decades. Water quality is, a measure is measurably improved, but still more needs to be done. Despite the past successes, the Liberals cancelled the fund. It makes no sense to reverse the real progress being made on the lake's environment. Will the Liberal government reverse its cancellation of the Lake Simcoe Cleanup Fund? Honourable Minister of Fisheries. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Honourable Member, uh, who I know it's his last day in the House today. Um, this government is committed to environmental sustainability. We've allocated significant funding to address water quality issues across this country, both freshwater and saltwater. We intend to ensure that on, on a go-forward basis that we are substantively addressing all of the various environmental concerns that have been raised in all regions of this country. The Honourable Member for Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. The Prime Minister has failed to list Iran's IRGC as a terrorist entity, even though three months ago the Liberals voted in favour of a Conservative motion to do exactly that. Meanwhile, on September 8, the IRGC launched an attack on Kurds in Iraq. The Liberals also failed to condemn this clear attack by Iran on its neighbours. When they voted for our motion, the, word took, the world took notice, and yet the Prime Minister has failed to act. How can world leaders take him seriously when he doesn't follow through on his clear commitments? When will they list the IRGC as a terrorist entity as called for by the motion? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, the, the Criminal Code terrorist listing regime is a very important tool to fight against terrorism. The listing of entities counters the financing of terrorism and helps law enforcement to prosecute terrorists and their supporters. The Islamic Revolutionary Guard Quads Force is already listed as a terrorist entity. The assessment process of other possible listings is ongoing. It is a serious and substantive process. Approved listings are published in the Canada Gazette. The member for Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Minister for explaining to us what listing is. The motion which the Liberals voted for, though, was very clear. It said to list Iran's IRGC as a terrorist entity, and it said to do so immediately. That was in the motion that he stood up in this House and voted for. Credibility in the councils of the world is not achieved through sparkly logos. It is achieved by doing what you say you will do. Again, when can we expect this Prime Minister and this Minister to do what they voted to do in this House on June the 12th, that is to immediately list the IRGC as a terrorist entity. Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Mr. Speaker, as the Honourable Gentleman knows, uh, there is a very specific process by law which the Government of Canada is obliged to follow. And if you don't follow the process, you obviate the result, Mr. Speaker. We are taking the steps that are appropriate in the circumstances and the results would be published in due course in the Canada Gazette and on the Public Safety Canada website. The Honourable Member for St. John's East. Mr. Speaker, this weekend, to celebrate the first ever United Nations International Day of Sign Languages, 
I participated in a rally organized by the Canadian Association for the Deaf about increasing recognition and awareness for American Sign Language, Long uh, des Signes Québécois, and Indigenous Sign Languages. Every day, 310,000 Deaf Canadians and their families contribute greatly to our society, and yet significant barriers still limitate their full participation in our society. Can the Minister please inform this House how our government is ensuring a more accessible Canada? The Honourable Minister of Public Services and Procurement and Accessibility. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member from St. John Deese for his very important question. We absolutely recognize the importance of sign language to the deaf and hard of hearing communities here in Canada, both as a means of communication but also of cultural significance. Our government is very committed to ensuring greater accessibility and opportunities for all. That's why our government was proud to table Bill C-81, which will help ensure that all people, regardless of ability or disability, can fully participate in society. I encourage all members of the House to support this bill and invite them to join me this evening for a reception with members of the Deaf community in celebrating International Day of Sign Language. For Selkirk, Interlake, Eastman. Mr. Speaker, the liberal tradition of failing our troops is back in action. The company picked to build Canada's new fleet of warships has asked the Prime Minister for a hard start date, but he refused. The Prime Minister refused, even though Irving faces potential layoffs due to his liberal mismanagement. He refused, even though he committed to continuing on with our national shipbuilding strategy, and he refused, even though our Navy needs new warships now. Will the Prime Minister do the right thing for Canada's ship workers and our Navy? Finally, finally make a decision and commit to a hard start date to build our new warships. Here, here. Uh, Minister of National Defence. Mr. Speaker, unlike the Harper Conservatives, our government is committed to ensuring that women and men of the Royal Canadian Navy have the equipment they need to do their work. We committed to purchasing 15 Canadian service combatants, an investment that is fully funded in our defence policy, Mr. Speaker, and that is contrast to the Conservatives where they only left enough money for nine ships. We are evaluating bids in order to ensure we select a warship that is best for the Navy while growing the economy and creating good middle-class jobs for Canadians. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Salaberry sur Roy. Mr. Speaker, supply management is so important to people back home, to farmers and our regions, that I received more than 400 emails on the topic over the past month. Following the concessions made on supply management under CETA and TPP, farmers in my riding are telling me they're nervous and they're having trouble believing what uh, the Liberals are saying. I understand them and I support them. Will the Liberals fully defend supply management? Because what they're saying now is not enough and everyone is worried. Now the Minister of Agriculture. Mr. President, and I appreciate my honourable colleague's question. As I said many times in this house, we're the party that implemented supply management, and we're the government that's going to defend here, supply here. management. We understand that supply management is a model for the world. It supplies quality products at a reasonable price to the consumer and stability for the farmer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Mississauga Lakeshore. Mr. Speaker, yesterday marked the beginning of the inaugural Gender Equality Week, an act that was put forward to provide an annual opportunity to amplify awareness, to continue conversations around gender equality and equity, and to inspire future generations of Canadians. Could the Minister please inform us how our government will mark the inaugural Gender Equality Week and how our government will ensure that the challenges Canadian women and gender diverse Canadians continue to face are addressed in our, in our daily work? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister. Mr. Speaker, advancing gender equality is an important part of our government's plan to grow the middle class because when we do so, we will add $150 billion to Canada's economy over the next eight years. When women entrepreneurs succeed, they create jobs for our sons and daughters. When we support those entering STEM fields, we address existing labour shortages. When we ensure that our workplaces and homes are free of violence, Canada is stronger. I'd like to thank my honourable colleague from Mississauga Lakeshore for his leadership and wish you and all Canadians a happy Gender Equality Week. The Honourable Member for Belchasse is Mr. Speaker, by using a very porous stone that absorbs water, will 
jeopardize the citadel of Quebec, and that is what Robert Ledoux said. He's an expert on stone and not uh, members of parliament. What is uh, the government waiting for to consult experts, to respect science, and to take steps to ensure that the integrity of the citadel uh, passes and goes be in before uh, the interests of the government? Our government values the rich heritage of the Quebec City Citadel. That is why we are taking steps to protect it. An open and transparent process awarded a Quebec bidder of the contract to replace the damaged stones. This bidder is required to adhere to federal guidelines to ensure that the Citadel retains its UNESCO status. National Defence is doing its due diligence to ensure that the winning stone adheres to the heritage qualification because we understand the importance of this to Quebec City. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Mirabel. Mr. Speaker, a Toronto newspaper last week reported that Canada was prepared to be making to, pre to make significant concessions on supply management, but not until after the Quebec election on October 1st. The Prime Minister is afraid of facing the Quebec consensus because he's abandoning producers. He told Americans himself that he's flexible on supply management. So my question is simple. Is Canada saving bad news for Quebecers until the day after the election? Of agriculture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate my honourable colleague's question. As I indicated many times in this house, we're the party that implemented supply management and we're the government that's going to defend supply management. Right. We're fully aware that supply management provides quality products for the consumer and a reasonable return for the farmer. Thank yeah, you, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Montcalm. Mr. Speaker, contrary to what we just heard, the White House confirmed that Canada prefers to wait until after the Quebec election to announce significant concessions on supply management. In fact, Everyone seems to be aware of this except Quebecers. So who's telling the truth? The Canadian government or the U.S. government? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Mr. Speaker, I appreciate my honourable colleague's question. And being a farmer and a former dairy farmer, I fully understand uh, the quality of the agriculture and the dairy farm and the supply management system we have in this country. I, it's very important. Every member on this side of the House supports supply management. Right, right, right. It's vitally important that every member on all sides of the House support the supply management system because it's very important for the country and for the agricultural sector. Honourable Member for Nunavut. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. The Government of Nunavut has asked for exemptions from the carbon tax in three areas transportation, fuel, home heating fuel, and fuel for power generation. Last spring, the minister recognized the unique circumstances of life in Nunavut and granted an exemption for aviation fuel, and I thank her for that. But my constituents are double taxed on the others, one at source and again at point of sale. Will the minister now do the right thing and grant exemptions for fuel for home heating and power generation for Nunavut? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Environment. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the Honourable Member for, for the question. Uh, this government understands that uh, Canadian Northerners feel the impacts of climate change differently than other Canadians do, and we also, also understand the unique challenges facing those who live in the Canadian North, such as an enhanced cost of living, an increased cost of transportation, and in fact food security issues that are not present elsewhere. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as we move forward, we're going to continue to work with the territorial government in Nunavut and the member opposite to ensure that we move forward with a way that will have a practical reduction on emissions that also recognizes the unique needs of those living in Canada's north. This will conclude question period for today.